You're all very, very welcome to this uh, end of year, end of term event of the post-colonial seminar, the modern and contemporary seminar, and also um, a culminating event. Um, we keep having these culminating events, and then there's yet another one, a culminating event of the Writers Make Worlds project. Um, a, an especially warm welcome to our guest this evening, the poet Patience Agbabi, um, a long-time fellow in creative writing at Oxford Brookes University here in Oxford and a University of Oxford alumna, and also a key figure in British poetry today. Patience studied English at Pembroke College, Oxford, following this with an MA in creative writing from the University of Sussex. It's a particular joy and privilege to host patients at Writers Make Worlds and at the Postcolonial Seminar as she is here by popular acclaim within the English faculty. When we launched our Writers Make Worlds exhibition in early 2018, it was a poster exhibition here in the, in the faculty foyer, when we did so, we put up a notice asking for students and staff to nominate the writer featured on the website that they most wanted to hear from. And Patience Agbabi's name easily topped the list. After completing her education, Patience Agbabi began performing poetry in clubs across London. And in 1995, her first collection, Raw, was published. It was awarded an Excel Literary Award in 97. She went on to publish four more standalone co collections as of this year, and she features in several anthologies, including Best British Poetry 2012 and Refugee Tales, which she will read from tonight. In 2017, she became a fellow of the Royal Society of Literature. She has been acclaimed as one of Britain's <coughs> most dynamic performance poets and perhaps the most radical Inflected by what she calls a bicultural upbringing and outlook, Agbabi draws in influences from not only Chaucer, but contemporary grime music, from Eliot and Plath to Public Enemy. <coughs> As this suggests, Agbabi's work is vividly performative, which is why it's so appropriate to host her work and reading within a project in which the emphasis has always been on audience and on voice but she's also intensely concerned with form and shape, and her refugee's tale weaves together a 15-sonnet sequence exploring tensions between formal convention and queering, and the queering destabilizing effects of experimentation and irregularity. During her time as the Canterbury Poet Laureate, Agbabi produced her fourth collection, Telling Tales, 2015, a sardonic, tongue-in-cheek, rebellious reworking of Chaucer's 14th century Canterbury Tales for Modern Times, which was shortlisted for the Ted Hughes Prize. In later work, her collaboration with the Refugee Tales Project, alongside Ali Smith, Abdul Razak Gurna, and others, um, in this work, Patience has continued to grapple with experiences of marginality and exclusion, experiences to which story can give shape and voice. We look forward to hearing from both works at this reading and then having discussions and questions about them. Just a short word on the, the format that this evening will take, um, and then I'll sort of briefly introduce myself um, and also my colleague, Marion Turner. We, we too are going to be in conversation with patients about her work. Um, so how it's going to work is we are going to invite patients to read from Telling Tales. Then we're going to have some short discussion about the work, uh, about her response to Chaucer. And then in the second half, we're going to move over to the Refugees' Tale, which patients is going to read from. We're going to have a bit more discussion about that within the panel. And then we're going to open for questions from uh, you, the audience. I can't think of a more appropriate interlocutor for the author of Telling Tales um, as than Marion Turner, who is Associate Professor of English uh, here uh, in the English faculty and at Jesus College, and is a medievalist of extremely wide and generous interests. Earlier this year, she published her already widely praised and highly recommended biography of Chaucer, A European Life. Uh, and as for myself, I'm Alec Burma, and um, I'm co-convener with Anki Mukherjee of the Postcolonial Seminar. 
Thank you very much. I wonder if we could uh, join together in giving Patience and Barbie a very, very warm welcome. Hello, can you hear me at the back? Thank you so much for that very, very generous introduction. And um, thank you to the English department at Oxford for inviting me here. It's very, um, it's an honour, but also quite surreal to be standing on this side um, rather than sitting at the back furiously making notes or falling asleep, but mostly making notes, I have to say. So um, I'm going to begin with um, a short reading from Telling Tales, which, of course, is um, a 21st century multicultural remix of all of Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. And um, you're just going to get three of them tonight, beginning with Chaucer's prologue. Um, to sort of pay homage to Chaucer's general prologue, I'd like to um, introduce each of these three characters with um, the brief author, author biography from the back of the book. Each of the biographies are 50 words long. I was even sort of playing with form at the back of the book as well as the front. So um, without further ado, I would like to introduce Harry Bells Bailey. Worked as bouncer when studying at London Guildhall Uni. Ended up managing pub. Now owns five London gastro pubs, including legendary Tabard Inn in Southwark. There, hosts monthly storytelling night, plain speaking, which mixes live performance with Skype. A couple of quotes from the National Press. London Bridge is dumbing down, The Telegraph. Highbrow meets high tech, The Guardian. <laughs> this is prologue, grime mix. When my April showers me with kisses, I could make her my missus or my mistress. But I'm happily hit, sorry home girls, said my vows to the sound of the bow bells. Yet her breath is as fresh as the west wind. When I breathe her, I know we're predestined to make music, my muse she inspires me. Then my mind's overtaxed, April fires me. How she pierces my heart to the fond root, till we bleed sweet cherry blossom en route to our bliss trip this day she goes off me. April loves me, not April loves me. With a passion, dear doctor, I'm wordsick, and I got the itch like I'm allergic, but it could be my shirt's on the cheap side. Serenade of a night with my peeps wide, nothing like a liqueur, an elixir, over proof that she serves as my sick cure. She's as strong as a ram, she is Aries. See my jaw-dropping jeans, she could wear these. See my jaw-dropping neat Anglo-Saxon. I got ink in my veins more than Caxton. And it flows hand to mouth, here's a mouth feast. Verbal feats from the streets of the southeast. But my April, she blooms every shire's end. Fit or vint, rich or skint, she inspires them. From the grime to the clean-cut iambic. Ring royal, rant or rap, get your slam kick. On this route, master bus, get cerebral. Tabard into Canterbury Cathedral. Poet pilgrims competing for free picks. Chaucer Towers track by track, here's the remix. From below the belt bass to the top notch. I won't stop all the clocks with a stopwatch. If the rhymes overrun, run offensive. Or run clean out of steam, they're authentic. Because we're keeping it real. Reminisce this. Chaucer Towers were an unfinished business. May the best poet lose, as the saying goes. May the best poet muse be staying those on the page, on the stage, on the subject. Me and April, we're the rhyming couplet. I'm the host for tonight, Harry Bailey. If I'm tongue-tied, April will bail me. I'm MC, but the M is for mistress. When my April shows me what a kiss is. Some of you may be familiar with um, Madame Eglantine. This is Missy Eglantine. Born St Lucia, raised in Lewisham, R&B singer-rapper-poet. Recording debut album. Training to be lay preacher. <coughs> Studied French, UEL Stratford. Owns three greyhounds, love, peace and justice. <laughs> Volunteer for RSPCA. Just opened beauty salon Peckham. Nails, jewels and curls. Life is busy. First collection, Excuse My French, published by Salt, 2010. <laughs> OK, so this one is not in the voice of Misty Eglantine, but in the voice of a young black man. He's 21 years old and he's dead. This one is called Sharps and Flats. Dear Mum, it's your son, Jay, chatting on a mix made in heaven. 
Don't hit the fade switch before it's played. Remember, used to have perfect pitch, but my pitch paid a rich trade when I got cut off by a switchblade. No need to pray, you ain't hearing voices. This score is the same voice age seven. Spoke like a thesaurus, wrote long stories, opened my throat like the dawn chorus. In God's gang, my chords sang, Alma Redemptoris. Mum, I was singing old Alma when the blade blast. Chew makes broken windows, rainbow like stained glass. Not looking out for the snake in the grass. Gets a boy stained in the vein by the caned class. I took a shortcut, a door shut. I was deaf blind to shut the up. Yeah, I mucked up their deadline. I was stuck up and my throat was a red line. At seven, hit heaven before I hit the headline. Martyr, made a martyr for back chatting in Latin sharps and flats. I had no idea what I was chatting. Two boys from the back flats thought I was backstabbing, so they stab with a sharp to cut me off from batting like a rich kid. So the switch did the talk, then the man's lied. Boys in blue twisted your words to you were hands tied in prayer. The nuns held you up like when dad died. Grief crashing down your face like a landslide. Mum, smile, it's me, Jay. Broader and far taller than the boy whose voice broke before he could call for help. The star scholar who grew far from squalor. Do re mi fa with my spa da melola. Got my cords cut, but I'm singing like it's Sunday. Boys got shut up, and I know this, that one day you'll come stay, so peace. Remember what the nuns say. Love conquers all. I sign off, your loving son, Jay. I know it was often difficult with that one. People aren't sure whether to applaud or not. Um, I'm aware that I'm doing some quite dark pieces. There are, of course, some real sort of below the belt sexual pieces in here as well, <laughs> as you well know. Um, but um, what, what stuns me is actually taking on the whole of the Canterbury Tales, just how much darkness there is in there. So, um, yeah, slight apology here. So the next one is also dark in a very, very different way and in a very, again, a very different voice. So this is the last one I'm going to read before, um, before our discussion. So I'll introduce again. This is Yejide Ido Clark. I'm a poet and publisher of academic books, educated at Queen's College, Lagos. I read PPE, specialising in philosophy at Magdalen College, Oxford, gaining a first class honours. I completed my master's degree in creative writing at Oxford Brookes University in 2009. I'm based in London and Lagos. This poem is entitled, I Go Back to May 1967, after Sharon Olds. I see them standing outside their family compounds. I see my father wearing a white agbada and crocodile shoes, instructing his driver by the spiked iron gate of their complex. He is just 24, but already a big man in Lagos. It is rainy season, the air heavy with his looming proposal. I see my mother walking barefoot on the red dust road to her village, a calabash on her head, wearing her only cloth and crucifix. She has just fetched water from the well. They have not yet met. Today they will be married. My father will arrive in his Cadillac to translate her into his bride adorned with gold. I want to approach them and say, stop, I am begging you. You are not a bad woman, he is not a good man. He is going to put you on trial like Job. You will bear him a daughter and later a son. And each time he will say his people have turned against you because you are from a small village and not educated. Each baby must be removed by force from your breast, but he will secretly place us in the care of my aunt to attend the best schools in the country. And you will draw the sign of the cross on our heads. Your womb will cry out, but you will not disgrace him, for you promise to honour and obey. In time, he will claim he wants a new wife, believes in one man, one wife, and wants a divorce. Will send you back to your village, barefoot and bareheaded, with barely a cloth to cover the belly that bore him two children. Then order you back, like a house girl, to manage the house and the wedding feast, for his beautiful new wife from a good family who resembles you because it is I 
your daughter, standing before you, young, adorned with gold. And only when you say, Olga, please, I beg you, do not treat your new wife the way you have treated me, will he reveal his deception to test your faith in him and your love of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to approach them there in the late May heat and say it. Her hungry, pretty face turning towards me, slow motion with the weight of the calabash. His arrogant, handsome face turning towards me, slowly with the precious weight on his mind. But I do not say it. I want to live my life. I take them up like Shango and Oshun mahogany dolls and rub them together at the hips, wood on wood, as if to make fire from them. And I say, do what is God's will and I will bear witness. Thank you so much, Patience. Um, I was really pleased that you started with your own version of the general prologue. Um, and that Chaucer's prologue starts, of course, with the extraordinary 18-line sentence, which you brilliantly rework. And what that sentence is partly about is the idea of inspiration. And you took those words from his, his prologue when you yourself are talking about inspiration there. And when he's talking about inspiration, and you take that very idea, the literal idea of inspiration, the breath of life. But I wanted to take that and ask you about your own inspiration and what it was, quite a simple question, that inspired you about Chaucer. Why did you choose Chaucer for this kind of magnum opus? <laughs> yeah, um, I think, well, it goes back a very long way. It um, goes back to... Um, oh, Oh, I might, I might, yeah, I'm, <laughs> right, yeah, is that better? Yeah, it goes back to um, A-level English, actually, where um, my English teacher set us a task of writing um, a, a prologue, a prologue, a, a character sketch from the general prologue, but a modern day character sketch. And um, he was quite a harsh marker, so he gave Bs throughout, but I got, only got my only A in two years from that. We almost all got A's for A-level because he was so tough on us. And... Um, and I loved doing that so much, I then went on to write quite a few other, um, well, I, in fact, I wrote two kind of general prologues to the then Colwyn Bay tales. I was living in North Wales at the time. And, um, and just, I just fell in love even then with the language. The teacher also read Chaucer in the original Middle English. And um, I was particularly excited by hearing it. And then, um, of course, then we read it on the page. And I was also, I'd, I'd done um, German O level, I was doing A level French, I was, I was able to sort of see the roots of some of the words and I was absolutely fascinated by the language at that stage and also bought an audio cassette which I still own. So um, it's really that thing that at the end of the Canterbury Tales Chaucer talks about anyone's hark to the little book but also reader, that sort of listening, both listening and reading which is very much the medieval sensibility that I didn't even know then, I just knew that that appealed to me and I think if, if anything I'd say Chaucer made me a poet and made me the poet that I am, because I realised even then, you know, back, back at, you know, as a 17-year-old, that, that the, the joy of poetry was about the, both the listening and the, and the writing, and those two things I've sort of taken with me for the past 30 years. And I think it's really interesting that you talk there about the language as a very primal and core part of your response to the importance of thinking about multilingual um, origins of Chaucer's language and of, and of the language that, that we speak. And I think in your poetry, what's very striking to me is that marriage between, on the one hand, you use lots of Chaucer's words, you play a lot with the formal, um, his own formal innovations, but you then yourself are also extremely innovative and extremely contemporary in what you're doing. And I think that is very true to what Chaucer himself does. I wanted to ask you about the process of writing telling tales and in particular as you you mentioned just now you chose to do all the Canterbury tales and usually in adaptations in translations people skip the boring ones <laughs> or they skip the controversial ones and as we heard that not only do you not do that but you chose to read tonight one of the most controversial ones so your version of the prioress's tale which is the tale that people don't want to talk about so I wondered if you could just tell us about why it was important to you to, to adapt all of the Canterbury Tales and maybe also 
what was which one was the most difficult to adapt? Yeah, um, I'm, I'm glad you, you sort of talked about the, um, the you know, the, the forms and the, the vernacular, Chaucer's vernacular, that's something I found really interesting revisiting. There were things as, as an undergrad I hadn't really picked up on. I think there's something about being a poet, it sort of forces you to really, in a way, sort of do look at, look at the text from the, the inside out rather than the outside in. Um, so it was very important for me to sort of, to attempt a very broad range of registers and, and, and of course, forms as well, especially Reem Royale, which is one of my favourites. Um, so um, I think, um, oh, what shall I say? I'm going, I've kind of lost it slightly, actually. So I was just a difficult material. Difficult, yeah. difficult, difficult material. I mean, I found, I mean, for example, like some of the, yeah, the religious ones especially were quite um, challenging. Um, I mean, the, the prior, I will talk briefly about the prior arrests because I performed it this evening. Um, you know, that one's known because it's so anti-Semitic. It's very problematic. Um, I didn't, I decided not to go down that route for obvious reasons. Um, but I, I decided to um, to use the, the, the case of Damalola Taylor, who, of course, was, was killed when he was nine years old on the streets of Peckham. Um, and, and, of course, I mean, Chaucer references Hugh of Lincoln at the end of his, so there's a, a direct parallel there as well. So I was trying to, in a way, show, unfortunately, things like, you know, violence on the streets of London is still happening, maybe, you know, all sorts of, a myriad of reasons. But, um, of course, we well know that anti-Semitism is, unfortunately, still alive and kicking. But, um, but I, I chose not to actually have a racial... Um, uh, a, uh, violence, act of violence, although some people read it that way, because you know, people who aren't familiar with the damn Nota Taylor killing, as was black on black violence, actually read it that way. But I don't think that matters too much. I think it's just that idea of violence on the streets. Um, the most difficult one was the physician's tale, which I think I mentioned we did an event in the covered market and I mentioned it then, um, which is, of course, about a man who, who beheads his daughter to prevent her being married off to a paedophile, basically. And that was extremely difficult. I mean, I I wrote probably about 20 different drafts, you know, trying to... At one stage, I almost didn't... I almost ran away from the horror of it. And then I realised I really had to, you know, sort of take it hands-on. And in the end, I, I created a kind of quite strange polyvocal piece that is quite visually unusual, that has all sorts of messages kind of running through it visually. And it's, it's, almost, it's impossible to actually perform. So it, even though I'm talking about Harkner, actually, with, with one or two of the poems, the, the actual visual impact on the page was, was more of an issue. And I think, I think it was important for that one that there couldn't just be one perspective. There had to be a, a multiplicity of, of, of perspectives. So that was definitely the hardest. I think that issue of the multiplicity of perspectives, even within a particular tale, as well as across the tales, is really interesting. And it was striking to me that the two tales that you read, as well as the, the prologue, and the tale that you've just mentioned are all tales about abuse and about child abuse, as well as the abuse of, of other figures within those tales. And in the two that you read tonight, they were voiced by a different person compared to the, the original tale. So you chose to voice them through one of the victims of abuse. And I wonder if you could just talk about that change of voicing and how hard that was, what, why you did that. I think I was very aware. I mean, all, all the tales. Are, ooh, <laughs> that Mike's doing very strange things, isn't it? Um, you know, the, the, I, I, off, I went almost exclusively for the first person narrative, and I think it's just my my politics. Really, it's that underdog thing. I can't help but but want to take on the voice of the underdog, and in a sense, show them sort of more. It's more empowering. Even even whoever bad thing happened, it's giving voice, which of course leads well to the whole. You know, why I got involved in the refugee tales project because it's that very much about the the, the silenced and having the privilege of being able to manipulate language and thinking, well, actually, what am I going to do as a writer? You know, I could write, well, I could, I, I can't actually write beautiful poems about flowers. I just can't do that. I don't, I don't blame people who do, but um, I'm certainly aware. I think, in, especially in the past few years, I think we've just been more aware, just with, just, just more aware of the world and how you can't really run away from writing about real things. So... Just, just one more question um, about telling tales before we shift over to um, refugee tales. Um, taking off from what you've been saying about the difficult material, um, it was also and about voice and about vernacular and about the eye voice. Um, the fact that you bring in, if you like, global voices, but in particular Nigerian voices, uh, West African voices, uh, I, I thought was kind of noteworthy and, and kind of 
really really bold and strong in the in in, in the collection and, and I, I wondered if you wanted to just talk for a moment about the challenges of doing that or how exciting that was to do I think one, the one I had the most fun with, which of course you haven't heard this evening, is The Wife of Bath's Tale, mm. which I've actually done two versions of, because I did a version in my second book, Transformatrix, which was just the kind of prologue to the tale. And then when I took on this project, of course, I had to include the tale as well. And it is eight minutes long. <laughs> I was told to read for 10 minutes. I thought I didn't just want to do the one poem. But, um, but yeah, that I, I had a lot, of, a lot of fun with that, especially because I was able to, um, to, to very closely echo some of Chaucer's lines and really sort of play, play with that. And, you know, as you know, my, I mean, my general speaking voice is English. I was raised here, but my family are Nigerian. And so it was, it was kind of a celebration of that. Um, but it was also important to have, you know, a different Nigerian voice. So having Yejide Udo Clark, you know, do, do, the, do the Clark's tale was, um, yeah, and, and kind of a little bit of Oxbridge stuff coming in. And even 2009 is a, when it's when I first started working at Brooks. So there's a little bit of me in there. Um, and then there's, there's also a mem memory of Nusu Sargent, who's, of course, from um, Zimbabwe. So I wanted to sort of be yes. a different African voice. And yeah. I've, I've, I've got Rush a Russian voice, which once uh, I did a, an event where we managed to get a proper Russian person to read it with, with their accent. So that, that was quite good because I can't do a Russian accent. There are some of these that I, you know, I run away from. So, um, yeah, but, but yes, inevitably, I think, you know, whoever takes on something like the Canterbury Tales, you have to put a lot of yourself into it. So... Another example I'd say in terms of form, because I like form, I'm, I wrote most of them quite formally. And, you know, this, so I, did re, I didn't run away from Reem Royale with all the rhymes and, you know, obviously, you know, rap and rhyming couplets, all that. Whereas, uh, whereas most other poet, contemporary poets would probably write most of it in free verse. Mm. And I think that, that was another thing. I, I did feel quite enough qualified to really take the, the verse forms by the horns and, and play around with them. Well, speaking of taking verse forms by the horns, um, could we invite you to read from Refugee Tale? Um, just a little bit of... Um, oh, that doesn't sound as loud as it does over there. Um, just a little bit of introduction. Um, yeah, the Refugee Tales, is, it's, it's a walk in solidarity with, with the refugees, asylum seekers and those who support them. And it's a series of readings every evening after the walk. There um, are two readings. It, initially, it was one by um, uh, the, the, the voice of a refugee, which had been told to a writer, uh, either a, a novelist or a poet. And the other one, usually somebody who'd supported them. And, um, and Refugee Tales is also a kind of movement to end indefinite asylum in the UK. So to introduce my poem, um, which is my, my I, I say my poem, it's not really my poem, it's like a shared um, collabor collaboration uh, with a woman whose name I say in the poem is Farida, but Farida is not her real name. She's very well known in her country of origin, so I was told to change her name. Um, I also changed her job, of course, to further uh, conceal her identity, but the, um, the actual trajectory of events in, in this poem are true. The Refugee's Tale. Maybe the real story begins here, in this office. Before you press record and we look in the mirror of each other's eyes, we're first time meeting. Maybe you say the word refugee in your head when you call me for reader. Refugee, what is that burn mark on your hand? You already have a story of the torture I suffered in my war-torn homeland. But these marks are from cooking bread for my family. This is the first time I'm cooking in my life. I never even made a cup of tea back home. I make a very good falafel. You must try. Are you recording? Food of the homestead. Christians, Muslims, we bake the same flatbread. Christians and Muslims break the same bread before the change. Though my parents are Egyptian, I am born in Sudan. Sudan is in my blood. Though I am always a Christian, even for 10 years I love Muslims more than Christians. My Muslim neighbours care for my parents when we jet set to Paris or Rome. I love Muslims as I love the Nuba, love my country. We cops, always first class. We had good English, all of us working in the banks. Cleaner to driver, 
Everyone is close to Farida, no door that is not wide open, thanks to God, since I leave university mid-year, and that day I start my career. The day I started my banking career, my parents complained, but they couldn't control me. Back then was good atmosphere. I am making good money. My husband is running his business, business in patents. We build a large family house. We have six children and some flats in Egypt for the pensions of our parents. Always we are donating to the poor of the brethren. Then government changes. Doors begin to close. At work, what took two hours now takes two weeks, and Christians are flocking overnight to the US. Then, the rumour of a banking leak. Watching the planes flying over my head, I refuse to leave my country, my homestead. I refused. I love my country, my homestead, my mother, my father, my husband's father and mother, the motherland. I would rather be buried dead than leave. I was the last one to leave. My brother-in-law, he's unwell. He needed support to heal his divided mind. We nurture him like a plant and polish each leaf, each flower to help seal him together like the two-faced that can't be divided by politicians, completely corrupted, splitting the country like an open wound. They insert a lie and these Christians abducted. I refused to cover my hair, but my heart was divided by language, river, boundary, country, the day I retreated my status to refugee. Why should I be treated as stranger, as refugee, in the country I was born, barricaded in my bank, while demonstrators outside shout blasphemy, hundreds, thousands fed with propaganda poison. We're told, remain calm, stay here, you have food. But my phone buzzed like a dying insect, my husband, my children, my parents pleading with God. I remembered the side door, the back exit, where the generator hummed in the dark, and I find myself descending the iron stairs, the noise of the crowd out front like a bull shark, and somehow my legs find the car, my hands on the gears, and my friend is closing the door, imagining the crowbar fist of the crowd pounding on my car. The fist-headed crowd are pounding on my car. My car is not moving. Each fist has a face that looks like my own. How can we be at war when the Nile flows through our twin faiths? If my car is my coffin, their fists are the clods of earth, the rich yellow soil of my country. I start the engine praying, dear God, let it, let it not stall. But my car is the black and the steel of a bulletproof jacket. Today it will save my life with my hands on the steering wheel and my life in the hand of God, it begins to move, and the waving fists part like the Red Sea. I still think it's miracle I find myself free. It's miracle I'm still having job, but my mind is not free. Each day government is ringing for bank information that I am not having. They don't believe me. More doors are closed in my face with no explanation. Maybe somewhere there's a typed memo. On a blank piece of paper, someone has printed my name. Someone is watching my house, how I don't know. Anger is a gloved hand and a flickering flame. That night, the family is sleeping on the second floor, except my oldest son and daughter coming back from Coptic Club. They open the side door and all they are smelling is smoke. Someone broke into our life, their hand through our window bars that night to smother the moon and stars. The night, smoke, choked the moon and the stars. I tried to call the fire. I tried to call them hundreds of times. If it wasn't for our neighbours hearing us shouting, my neighbours came and there was water. I shouted like crazy, please, please help us at this address. And nobody came. 
like they arranged it maybe, the fire brigade not to come and we all perish. My husband insisted to break the room and go inside and the flames. I was so worried about him, but my neighbours, all my family survived. We prayed there together, Christian and Muslim. In the heat of the fire, we knelt on the earth and wept. I thought I forget, but their love I'll never forget. I thought I forget in this life, but I'll never forget the three hours it took for the fire engine to arrive felt like three days. There is no regret. We were lucky to be alive. But how can you sleep then, knowing the country you love wants you to die? How can you close your eyes shut when they've been pitted like an olive? I'm praying to God every night, but then after that, they started with my husband. He was away with his business abroad. They arrested him at customs, coming back to our country, his papers ignored. He sent something bad, would, had a premonition. The day they imprisoned my husband, he had not eaten. They put my husband in prison. He is not eating the right foods. They knew he was diabetic, but they're starving him of insulin. Wouldn't let me give his medicine. I was frantic. I didn't know where he was based. Didn't know what they can do to him to get to me. And finally I decided there was no way. I could not resist. That's when I decided to leave my beloved country. They said, you should be grateful we left you in peace. This is a Muslim country, but we let you pray in your churches. Cooperate for your husband's release. I know nothing of that bank information to this day. Always I'm wearing my cross and refuse to sweat in the heavy black and steel of a bulletproof jacket. The heavy black and steel of a bulletproof jacket is the depression I wear on the worst days when freedom here weighs heavier than the death threat back home and my family fall on their knees. But back home I refused. Why should Farida wear widow's black when there is still hope for my husband to bend the bars on his prison windows? Always there's light on the horizon. I knew a Muslim high official, a friend of my husband. Farida, trust me, I have a plan. So I'm buying us tickets to London, even then thinking we can come back when things cool down. The day of his release, I'm barely breathing. Meeting him at the airport, the sky is bleeding. When I met him at the airport, he was bleeding. His chest was full of blood and he had ulcerative colitis. He is needing urgent medical, very sick. He bled onto the flight and is sleeping very peaceful, and the whole of my family is here and safe. As soon as we land, we take him to hospital, and they save his life. An international visa is an open door, but the next day we go to Croydon to claim asylum, and though the lady is very kind, it pains me more than everything to cut myself from my home, my country, with each section of my claim. My story, depressed photo in a frame. The story depends where you put the frame. With my oldest son, my oldest daughter, each in a separate room, but exactly the same questions. Each the author of a story they will match to see if the grief fits together the jigsaw of what it is to love your country and be forced to leave your whole life behind in broken images. For me, it was lucky. Maybe God knows how much I suffered. Maybe it was easy to check my job, my contacts. Maybe the fictions in the newspapers were detained by the facts. Now, I'm underclass, my head covered with shame. How am I begging when I can't remember my name? How can I begin to remember my name when I can't leave the house? when the ache of leaving my mother 
she died. The blame is too much. My whole body drowned with grieving in this room with the ribbed roof where I sit with my sins, heavy as Jonah. This silent attic where memories play back like the cries of muezzins mixed with the cries from the priest when she first fell sick. But good people come who open me to feel again for others. And as I translate the words of a refugee life to a form, I begin to heal. Their voice is my own voice, striking a chord. May our truth conquer fear. Maybe the real story begins here. Maybe the real story begins here when Christians and Muslims broke the same flatbread. The day I started my banking career and refused to leave my country, my homestead. Maybe the day I retreated my status to refugee. Or the fist-headed crowd pounding on my car and the miracle when I find myself free. The night, the smoke choked the moon and the stars. I thought I'd forget but some things you never forget. The day they imprison my husband, he is not eating. The heavy blackened steel of my bulletproof jacket when I met him at the airport, broken, bleeding. The story ends where you put the frame. But however it begins, remember my name. patience for that reading. Um, well, there's, there's so many ways, ways into this bit of the discussion. Um, I wondered if you could just talk to us a bit about, descriptively even, about what it was like to, um, to write a, a highly crafted poem, this 15 sonnet sequence with everything coming together in the 15th sonnet, mm -hmm. as you've just read. Um, but to do that in respect of a story of another you know, that was narrated to you, presumably not in her first language. Uh, I think you, you reflect that in the use of the language. You know, it's a, it's a, there's translation going on of all kinds in that, in that tale um, and in relaying that tale. Could you just talk to us a bit about how, how that worked for you, the demands of form as against the demands of the tale? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, all, all the writers who, who um, we, we all conducted interviews, basically. Um, there, were, there were people from uh, the Gatwick Detainee Welfare Group there, so they built up long-term relationships with, with each of the, the respondents, which was very important for them to feel safe. Um, and, um, and it was actually her first language she did. It was in, in, in English, right. her interview. I mean, she spoke good English because she worked in a you know, very high-powered job, but at the same time, her idioms... Were, and I, I know an Arabic speakers have said that they can they can spot the Arabic idioms in the way that she speaks English. Um, so I really I wanted, to, and I think we all discussed this, all, all the writers. We wanted to honour as much as possible the original interviews, but at the same time we had been brought into the project as writers, mm -hmm. and so it was imperative, you know, that we 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 created a work of art out of the the interviews. Now there are there are projects where they um, they literally you know transcribe interviews and, th and this was a very different kind of project the point was that we were brought in for our expertise so so I, I basically all the um, the key phrases the, re the repeated lines and as you know I took liberties because I kind of slightly changed mm -hmm. the repetitions as, as George Surtees does in, in his um, he calls them Hungarian coronas I think many uh, European cultures kind of um, take um, credit for creating the, the 15 sonic corona but um, the, the repeated lines were lines that really struck me from the original interview that I really wanted to sort of work with but uh, but on top of that there's a lot of her voice in so it was as, as much as I could I, I, I transcribed a lot of it but not all of it and um, and basically sort of pieced it around um, the, the repetitions so I more or less knew and I actually of course wrote the 15th sonnet first with all those repetitions in and then sort of crafted the rest of, of it around um, and, and um, Farida was 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 very pleased with 
the work. In fact, I think she was very pleased it was very poetic and she really wanted it to be poetic. So that was important. Most, most of the refugee tales are, are prose. Um, but I have to say, uh, they're very crafted. Mm. They are very crafted. I mean, they, that's, you, you know, I'm very pleased to see you have the Refugee Tales 3 mm. on the table because the project has snowballed and so every year the walk's got a lot bigger and the amount of MPs of, of, all, of all parties, I will say, have been involved in trying to change the law, um, you know, to, to reduce the, um, the indefinite asylum in the UK. So it, it's just turned into this wonderful thing which also um, very much supports in the year there are walks as well supporting... The, the refugees involved in the project, so, yeah. Thinking of the different roles that are in play in that situation where, where Farida is telling her story and you are crafting it and creating a, a work of art, um, you, are, you then become the teller or the reteller of, of, of the story, but you are also, at first, her audience. And then you as it were, relay her story to a much wider audience through the work of art. Could, could you talk a little bit about the, the how you sort of see as, a, as, as the poet in that situation, but also as the listener to the, to the story, how you, how you see that role of teller, but also how you see the relationship with that, with that wider audience? And one way of taking this question is, you know, what is it to write sort of activist first that is not, nonetheless you know, highly crafted, um, and, and, and yeah, who's, who, who's the audience, who, who, who's listening? Um, when, when the project was set, the project was set up because people were saying, in, in, people in, um, in, 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 in incarcerated in, in Brook House at, um, at Gatwick were, were saying, no one's telling our story. So we want people to tell our story, and that's why Anna Pincus kind of set up the whole project. So we were very, very aware that we were kind of, uh, in David Hurd's amazing um, afterward, he talks in, in Refugee Tales 1, he talks about um, how the voices of refugees are often silent, so even the hearings are not written down, which is shocking. You know, it's almost like, they're not even, it's not like a court or anything, they just kind of make up the rules as they go along, it's just disgusting, so there's all sorts of stuff goes on behind closed doors, so it was sort of... It was uh, all, all that was was behind the whole project. Um, I actually felt very uncomfortable at the beginning. Um, I mean, I said I'd do the project and I wanted to do the project, but I was like, how on earth am I going to, you know, take someone else's words? He felt this massive sense of responsibility, and again, it's we all felt the same thing that you know you wanted to sort of get it right somehow. And I think the way we all did it, as I say, was by using as much of their um, their, their words as possible, but also. Um, uh, I think I think that I think the politics of it overrode that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we, we all we all feel to some degree like the sense of almost like the ancient mariner. We have to repeat mm -hmm. the story. And, and David again mentioned David Heard. I've worked with many many occasions. He he he's one of the co-coordinators of the project. He talks about you know you can never repeat these stories enough. Uh, and 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 I suppose the another major issue is to acknowledge how as human beings you know storytelling is fundamental to who we are and um, so giving voice to these tales is, is a it cuts across the rhetoric of the press you know that, that was in, and, 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 and actually the refugee tales project sort of predated the refugee crisis I put that in quotes um, by a number of months so um, what can I say I mean you, you do have the weight of responsibility, but you also, you have the blessing, I certainly have the blessing, I've eaten a lot of falafel, and it is very good falafel, I have to say, so on a sort of plus note, you know, for, for example, it was, it was uh, the very first reading I gave in, it was then 2015, I, I read the poem, the refugees, and, and Farida was at the back of the audience, and, um, and she just hugged me and said, it's me, that's all she could manage, but she just, thank you, it's me. And I thought, and even when I read it, I get goosebumps because it's her voice. Mm. And, it, and it's a different, it, it's a totally different um, experience of voicing to me, you know, being Yejide Do Clark or, you know, being Harry Bell's Bailey. It's, it's just, you know, it's never, it's never felt like my poem. Mm. But um, another, another thing that, that David, David mentions in the introduction is about... Um, um, the fact that a lot of the refugees, you know, asylum seekers don't feel able to stand up and tell their tales. You know, even if they did, they, some of them are still going through, you know, through the legal process. Some of them just don't have the confidence. But 
as the projects progress, more and more of them are standing up and they've actually, you know, in Refugee Tales 3, there are some that were written and are voiced in public by them. And, that's, and that was another imperative of the project, was to empower, you know, the, 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 the asylum seekers to themselves to, be, to feel able to get up and, you know, read their own stories. I think what, what you're saying there about the importance of you know, revoicing, retelling stories is obviously such an important part of, of trauma and how people process trauma. This is a text that I've taught on a, on a course about writing lives and we talk quite a lot about how trauma is processed through writing and narrative. Um, but it's also, of course, it's a course within the, the English department and we're thinking a lot about about form as well and about the formal qualities and I suppose what I what I want to ask is really about about the use of other narratives so this again is a very Canterbury Tales inspired a, a very ostentatiously Canterbury Tales inspired collection which quotes a lot from the Canterbury Tales and some of the tales are are interweaving them but beyond that it's also influenced by lots of other literature and as we've been discussing I mean, your tale is one of the most, I think, formally complex, perhaps the most formally complex, um, though it has some other competitors, but the way that you use the sonnet form, as we all heard, the concatenation, the sonnet redo, but it, it's so striking. And so that is a long preamble for saying, why does it help us to narrativize our own lives or other people's lives through the literary past and through others' literary forms? Ooh, that's quite hard. It's, it's a huge question. <laughs> how does it? How does it help us? Um, I suppose it touches something very primal in us. Um, the, the, the form, you know, form is it, it's a, the repetitive nature of form. I think the way it, it mirrors actual speech as well. I mean, obviously, clearly, this is it, it's it's originally coming from an interview. But on top of that, of course, form, the very nature of form is about echo, is about you know, echoing rhythms or echoing rhymes. I, I remember feeling initially thinking, am I allowed to you know, take this Sudanese you know, stroke Egyptian woman's story and, and then and, and plonk this sort of European form or encase it in what you know, and it can even, some people argue the sonnet is a male construct if you take it even further. I've, al I've always been um, very, um, very partial to the sonnet. So it's a, it's a form I, I come back to. Um, there's a quote, I can't never remember who said this, it might be someone like Lavinia Green or a poem is a, a means of remembering, remembering itself. Mm -hmm. That sense of um, telling it as a poem, I think, I would argue, makes it more memorable than as prose. Or the, you know, but shoot me down some of the other, because some of the prose is absolutely wonderful, but I do think there's something particular that poetry can do that, that, you know, that distillation of language, that the, the form, the, the, the really strong musicality that takes us right back to the oral tradition, I think that it sort of works on a very primal level. And so I think, I think that's what, you know, makes, makes the story kind of even more, I don't know, stay in people's minds perhaps. Just before we open for, for questions um, more broadly, um, I had a, 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 a choice of question. I just wanted to sort of bring it, bring it full circle. I mean, you, you, you spoke, you know, very compellingly at the beginning about how Chaucer made you a poet and your relationship to him um, and to his work when you were um, an A-level student. Um, has the Refugee Tales project and the whole project of, of completing writing and subsequently performing telling tales has it given you a, a further, deeper understanding, a different understanding of, of Geoffrey Chaucer and, and his whole project of giving voice to the pilgrims of Tabard Inn? Oh, that's interesting. Um, I sort of, I think when I, when I first started doing the project, I was uh, almost like prostrating myself on the ground the sort of the, the granddaddy of English literature. I think I've <laughs> sort of, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say insight into Jules. I suppose, I suppose taking on individual tales, you, until you actually have to try to rework a tale, I don't know. I, I, I mean, I, I, I'm sitting here with some esteemed academics who have gone right into the nitty gritty of the language. But most of us, certainly as an undergraduate, when I was you know, on the other side back there, I didn't, I didn't go as deep anywhere near 
as deep. You know, even things like the canon's yeoman's tale and all those alchemy terms, the terminology, being very aware of how different the language was. Although one thing that I am proud of, we, we, I did do the Pardus tale for A-level, and so I did have some understanding of the sort of Latin, French and, and um, Middle English sort of hierarchy and, and how he was, you know, he himself manipulated languages, and it still remains one of my favourites, which I'm um, glad to say we, we did an event in the covered market fairly recently around the Pardus tale. Um, so... Um, it, insight, just respect, just absolute mm -hmm. deep respect about the, 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 the range, the sheer, the sheer range of, you know, being able to tell tales from so many different sources, so many different registers, so many different levels, so many different sort of, you know, the, the way he manipulates, you know, Reem Royale, the, the different rhyming couplet, the individual voices, the characters, the interplay. I mean, I didn't even go with the interplay of characters. I, I stayed clear of that. It, it really is a remarkable work of fiction. So, yes, I, I, every time I... You know, every time I went back to, to do a tale, I, my sort of respect for Chaucer deepened even, even more, I think, as, as, as a writer, as a person, I don't know. You, you, maybe Marion's the one to uh, answer that one. It's really great to, to close with the accent on reading and on voice and on the, the voice that is spoken, the voice that is heard as we read. Um, that fits in with all kinds of chords that have been struck across this, this project. So, so that, that's wonderful. Um, just before we, we, we thank uh, patients very, very much, um, I would just like to repeat, there are drinks uh, just outside in the foyer of the English faculty. You just go out the, the door and it's on your right. Um, you're all very, very welcome to, to come and have a glass of something soft or, or not soft. Um, a red or white or, or, or water or elderflower uh, with us and to talk further about poetry and about voicing. Um, and um, now could you all please join with me in thanking Patience like Bobby. I think she's taken us very deep and in very interesting ways into the whole process of what it is to voice, to give voice and to tell tales. Thank you very much. Thank you.